Good morning, everyone. This is Philip Schroner speaking. I'm the director of CEPE, uh, and based here in Bogota, Colombia, I want to welcome you all. Uh, and we want to start today on time, even though that we are still missing some colleagues, but the good news is that all our panelists are with us. First of all, like I said, a welcome to everyone. We want to welcome you to the third webinar of Beyond uh, the Numbers. It is harnessing, actually, the data for the SDG webinar series, which is a partnership of Paris 21, uh, who is based in Paris at the OECD, Open Data Watch, our partners in Washington, D.C., uh, NCP, um, and who is speaking at this very moment, Philip Chandra, the director. I'm joined here at my office by my colleagues, Freddy Rodriguez, Margarita Baca, and also Alexandra uh, Roldan, who will give you also a, a brief uh, about what we will do today. Today, our webinar is non-traditional data source Sources, uh, and we want to showcase uh, in a very practical and hopefully uh, very uh, orientated on evidence uh, on how non-traditional data sources can be used to measure the sustainable development goals, but also challenging on doing it um, on real time and how we can connect uh, to those that are not only taking those decisions, but preparing uh, the implementation, the monitoring and the evaluation, and therefore we have invited today uh, three panelists uh, that come from very different backgrounds but all connect one theme which is actually what you can see behind me the sustainable development goals uh, we have first of all Ana Maria Blanco who is the director of public policy and international relations uh, of GSMA uh, I will uh, give the floor in a second to all the panelists to simply briefly present themselves and then I will go over uh, to the question since I don't want to make this a monologue of myself. Um, the second person that we have, and Ana Maria is at this very moment, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in New York. Um, and uh, Rebecca, first from OpenStreetMap uh, HOT, she is the Community and Partnerships Manager, and she will talk about citizen-generated data. Ana Maria will talk about big data for social good. And Rebecca, going back to her, uh, she works at the UK uh, institution, but at this moment she is actually in the Western Hemisphere, very close to us uh, in Peru, uh, in Lima, Peru. So good morning to you as well, Rebecca. And the third person we have, we will connect uh, to Africa, more concretely to Accra, uh, to Ghana, because we also wanted to see how those non-traditional data sources actually connect uh, to a national statistical office. And therefore, we have uh, invited Omar Seydou, uh, who you can see, who is also attentive, who is the principal statistician of the Ghana Statistical Service. And there we wanted to have a more, um, well, let's say, um, of official view on how those big data, non-traditional data sources can connect in order to monitor and evaluate uh, the SDGs. About uh, the methodology that we will have this morning, colleagues, uh, it will be very easy. We will not have presentations of the three persons uh, who are our panelists. Uh, we will go to them directly with some questions and do some roundtable discussions in order to get their feedback with very concrete examples. And from there on, uh, we will uh, give you the floor, the audience that are connected at this very moment, in order to raise your questions, concerns, and uh, interact uh, with the panelists. So I would like to give over to my colleague, um, Alexandra Roldan, who will simply give you, uh, the panelists, and also uh, uh, the attendees simply some methodological background and then we take it uh, back to our panelists. So once again, good morning from Borota, Colombia and over to you, Alexandra. Thank you, Philip, for the introduction and welcome again to the third webinar of the Beyond the Number series. First, and this is for the participants and you can, as you can see from the go to webinar window on the right side of your screens, there is a question box where you can write to the speaker questions throughout the discussion. We are selecting a number of these questions to comment around them on the second part of the webinar. Also, and this is for the speakers, as you can see from the right side of your screens, there is a chat box where you can write directly to the organizers if you happen to have any problem during the webinar or want to let us know something. Second, this webinar is being recorded. We will be uploading it afterwards to the partners' websites, Paris 21, Open Data Watch, and CEPAY. 
and sharing it on our social media account, which we will post in a moment on the questions box. So if you want to share this webinar with some colleagues or have to drop out, don't worry, you still will be able to watch the rest of it. And lastly, we also have a Gmail address, which is beyond the numbers webinar at gmail.com. So if there are any questions or comments you have on this specific webinar, feel free to send us an email. We look forward to stay engaged after this discussion. And back to you, Philip. Very well. So uh, thank you, Alexandra. I hope everything is clear. And uh, like she said, if there are any questions, there is the chat where you can connect to her um, and we open up now <coughs> the discussion. So uh, we said very clearly uh, why are non-traditional data sources um, important for the sustainable development uh, goals in order to monitor and evaluating. We have heard many times now during the last months um, that we don't have actually real-time data that connects to the decision makers and one of those actors that actually have been piloting uh, doing work around uh, generating uh, data and actually bringing big, big data to the sustainable development goals are uh, the telecom communications companies uh, around the globe this is why we invited Ana Maria Blanco and we wanted to know a little bit more Ana uh, from your side give us some real examples on what telecoms are actually doing and why is it important to connect to you um, for the sustainable development goals. So over to you, Anna, and good morning to you once again. Good morning, Philip, and thank you very much for inviting me and having the GSMA participating in this webinar. It's very exciting for us to be able to share what we are doing because, like you say, the mobile industry has been very innovative and creative in using data for social good. So I want to tell you a little bit about our program, which is called Big Data for Social Good, um, which was started by the GSMA knowing that mobile operators have unique data that nobody else has. Now, the management and, and process of data is very, it, it's a very serious matter, and our industry takes, us, takes it as such. So, within the limits of the law, and also in, in many cases going even beyond the law and creating our own best practices on how to manage personal data, we have created a program where we have a framework as to how operators can use the data in an aggregated and completely anonymized form to draw insights and help aid agencies, be it from governments or from relief organizations, to address certain social issues. And in each country, the program has taken a different shape. So we started at the very beginning when we launched this program back in 2016. We didn't even know if this was going to work. We didn't know if the operators were going to be willing to, to um, work with the data in this way because it, it requires a lot of resources to work with the data and that's being um, done by the operators. We didn't know if the relief agencies were going to be able to have enough information from the insights that we were sharing with them. So we launched a pilot and the pilot started with three cases. Um, two of them were on health. So I'm going to give you the example in, in India, which I love that example because India has a big problem of tuberculosis, a disease that is tremendously contagious, but also is a disease that in other parts of the world, it doesn't exist anymore. But in India, it's millions of cases each year and millions of deaths caused by tuberculosis each year. We were able to work with Airtel, which is the main operator in India, to draw um, movement patterns from the data. We don't, like I said before, observing privacy um, considerations. We don't track Ana Blanco going to the hospital registering for tuberculosis. That's not, but we do manage aggregated information as to what are the regions where tuberculosis cases have been um, on the rise. We overlay that data with hospital data. So that's a very close collaboration we have with the health sector because only mobility data wouldn't help. We need to know 
what cases of tuberculosis are being reported in which regions. And then we track from the mobility data, from the regions that have been affected, where have been where are we seeing important movements? And this is in real time, what you were mentioning before, important movements of a significant amount of people from a, con a red area. If you see the maps, it's all color coded. So red area is where contagion is high. If they are moving to green areas. So we can alert the authorities and the hospital, the health system in the green areas because what it was happening before is that suddenly a lot of cases were coming of tuberculosis to hospitals and hospitals were not prepared. They didn't have enough medicine. Um, in some cases, they didn't know how to treat it. So we can now give early warnings to those areas where we see the mobility happening. We can also, we are working with the population to raise their awareness and know what to do, how to take care of themselves, how to prevent contagious. The pilot was very successful. The government was thrilled because they have a goal of eliminating tuberculosis by 2025. And they have been trying different things through the local authorities, but these components, being able to give them real time data and having a mass reach to the population allow them to be very impactful and very scalable through the use of, of this data. Uh, now it's not a pilot anymore, now it's an established program and hopefully India will reach, with the help of the mobile industry, will reach their goal by 2025. That's one example. We have similar examples um, in, in Myanmar, in Brazil, now the trials are over and the program has proven to be successful. So now it's an established program. We are starting to work on disaster prepared, preparedness and response in Latin America with Colombia, actually Chile, Peru, as well as Japan. And in Turkey, we're starting something similar with displaced population. Um, Hello, Maria, let me, yes. let me interrupt you here for one second and ask you a follow-up question and then give over to Rebecca because we want to then actually close then the cycle of the two examples that you uh, will give us uh, and give the word then to Omar uh, in order to see how a statistician see what you actually just explained to us. Uh, so Anna, give us uh, a little sense of the scope uh, and actually your vision of scaling up uh, this exercise uh, in India, you mentioned other countries, uh, but how sustainable is that and how much interest are you actually finding within the telecommunication uh, companies that are part of GSMA? This is an easy exercise and you're getting actually real-time data uh, in order to analyze it and mine it, uh, or how is that exercise in, uh, in reality looking um, and how mm -hmm. much okay. are you seeing from the telecom? That's a, very, a, a, a super good question because it's, it's part of the preoccupation of our program. Is this sustainable? And um, part of it is what you just mentioned, is not an easy exercise. It's not just getting the data, processing and passing over. For operators to collect and securely keep this data and then to process it, it requires a lot of resources. And they, it, it is the operators, the one who are putting in these, these resources along with the GSMA. We have our own analysts, we have a team that processes the data with all the Chinese walls required for the data to be protected and secured, and then the team analyzes, draws the insights, and then finally sharing it. So it is a very complex and expensive and resource-intensive process. Now, the places where we have seen it being successful is where the government and the relief agencies are willing to cooperate with the industry and willing to work within the resource limitations that the industry has. The program right now has 20 operators working on it. The 20 largest operators, we are covering about, I think, 65 to 70 percent of the world mobile connections. So that's a lot of connections. But to give you a, an idea, like a comparable, we have 20 involved, but our membership is 750. So out of the universe of 750, we are engaging with 20. 
is not an easy, it, it, so it's on both sides, right? What operators are willing to put in their resources and do this? And where, in what countries, we find the receptiveness needed for the operators to do that? So I hope that that answers. Yeah, that, that, that helps a lot. Uh, and thank you, Anna, for that initial thoughts. Um, and now I would like to go over to Rebecca. Like I mentioned at the beginning, she, she is at this very moment uh, in Lima, Peru, joining us. And Rebecca uh, has a lot of experience in bringing in non-traditional data sources into the equation of the SDGs. Uh, but I don't want to take uh, her words of what OpenStreeter uh, Map Hot actually does and. How they connect, uh, but I would like to ask you, Rebecca, to to build on what we have here, third of the telecoms, and how they connected to the SDGs. Uh, what is the work actually you do, uh, and how are non-traditional data sources actually now uh, the real true oil, as we have heard, or are you actually running into some bumps as well, or empty gas stations uh, in order to really fuel up um, the data ecosystems for SDGs? So. Rebecca, Rebecca, uh, we are happy to have you, and once again, welcome. The floor is yours. Yeah, thanks so much uh, for the invitation to participate um, in the webinar and, and for those questions. Um, so really high level, if you haven't heard of OpenStreetMap, um, it is uh, basically what uh, OpenStreetMap is to maps, what Wikipedia is to encyclopedias. Uh, it's an open, editable map of the world with over 4 million users. Um, and at Humanitarian OpenStreetMap, um, we use uh, this tool for uh, humanitarian and development interventions. Um, so essentially areas where there isn't enough physical data or there isn't enough social data, uh, we use this kind of map um, to understand better what's, what's happening in that place. Um, so I think that ties in quite neatly to kind of CGD in the sense that CGD is data that is always created in response to a problem. Um, so most CGD projects have a specific kind of issue or cause in mind. I know Omar also has some, some really strong examples um, from Ghana about this. Um, and data is also often collected by the target audience. Um, so citizen generated data, obviously this is created by people. Um, one thing we really try and do with HOT is engage the sort of B in leave no one behind, the people who are not included in data sources for lots of uh, very understandable reasons, uh, but sometimes those reasons are things like security, um, the fact that it's really hard for other people to access those populations, et cetera. So if those people can actually create data themselves um, about their own kind of lives and experiences, um, then that really helps us to make sure our data is more representative. Um, so whilst that's not necessarily true of all CGD projects, it is, it is common across a lot of them. Um, and I think it's a really big strength that CGD brings to the, the sector because um, you can kind of, I guess if you look at the, um, one thing I'm a real kind of advocate for is for all these different types of data to work together. Um, and I think it's much better if you look, for example, at gaps in um, gaps that exist and then try to kind of plug those gaps rather than kind of proposing a solution to take over. Um, and CGD is a, is a really strong uh, way to do that in, in particularly in low resource areas and, and areas where people are being sort of left out of, um, left out of other, other data collection methods. Um, I think there's probably a bit of a difference between kind of measuring the SDGs and achieving the SDGs in terms of data. Um, I'd say for CGD, I think achieving the SDGs um, is probably the lower hanging fruit um, because, as I said, it, it's data that's in response to a problem. Um, and so it enables you to very quickly get kind of information to, to run a program. Um, to give some really, really simple and quick examples around how OpenStreetMap um, can, can support that. Um, similar to Anna's example, malaria elimination is also on the minds of many, many governments worldwide. Um, and as you work towards elimination, you, you really need household level data to understand the, pro the progress of spray and bed net campaigns um, and to understand the reasons why communities, for example, are not using or rejecting those. Um, so something that's really easy to gather um, in something, something like OpenStreetMap. Um, and then I guess in terms of to talk to your thing around, around bumps in the road, um, 
I think there are some really great opportunities for um, CGD to engage in measurement of, of the SDGs. Uh, one really simple one would be the indicator around um, proportion of population living within a two, two kilometers um, of a year round road. You know, to, to measure that, you need to know where the roads are and where the people are. So a map is a perfect option. Um, however, I think in terms of that kind of longer term measurement, there aren't a huge number of examples of where CGD is really being used um, at a national scale, um, though it is being used at, at smaller scales. Um, we've been kind of talking and working around this quite a bit over the last um, over the last year and in partnership with the Global Partnerships for Sustainable Development Data um, have just re released kind of a bunch of resources which um, help kind of people who want to get started with CGD to do that. So essentially kind of defining um, key uh, methodologies, defining what should be kind of in place to ensure confidence in the data, etc. Um, and I think that's probably the biggest kind of um, area of opportunity that isn't yet being um, being fully realised. Um, but uh, hopefully kind of with time um, and as I say, with, with thinking about this kind of complementary um, data, kind of looking at gaps in other data sources and seeing how how they can be um, easily plugged by, by a CGD solution, um, I think would be would be a kind of appropriate um, way to move it forward. Uh, so I'll stop there, just conscious of time, um, but happy to answer any follow ons. Thank you. Yes, and we will actually have uh, quite a lot. Uh, you came into measuring and achieving SDGs, which I believe uh, could be uh, a good discussion for our webinar, uh, because that's actually segmenting uh, our discussion very much. And you also mentioned, uh, Rebecca, uh, methodological aspects. And I think we will have, uh, during the Q&A, uh, quite a lot of persons uh, actually wanting to know more about it, uh, because that's uh, one of those two tools that we can provide uh, as generating and transferring knowledge, uh, those methodological tools. I would also like to encourage you to talk a little bit more uh, in the next question about how open those are, uh, how co-created uh, those experiences are uh, in order to see how they are connected to other data ecosystems or initiatives around uh, the globe or uh, specifically at a national level. Uh, we will now connect to our third person. Like I said, we went from Lima Peru uh, and are now going to, to Accra in Ghana and we took it actually quite serious uh, the first two intervention which was about uh, telecoms and uh, street maps as well because Omar is not only uh, on the street uh, in his car at this very moment on his mobile phone uh, so actually we wanted to do it a real experimentation if uh, in the 21st century we, we can connect to him uh, so we have uh, Omar Seydou uh, the principal statisticians uh, from Ghana uh, and Omar you have now listened uh, both to Ana Maria and to Rebecca uh, big data non-traditional data sources uh, and let's get straight to the point uh, you as a statistician are you using this data can you use it and are you connecting it in order to bring uh, actually uh, the achievements uh, on the ground of the SDGs um, in showing them how far we are actually going in a four year uh, in process. So over to you, Omar. Tell us how much of the reality and utopia are we actually talking about when those data comes to a national statistical office? And good afternoon, actually, to you since we yeah. are still moving around here. Thank you, uh, Flip, and uh, thank you for extending the invitation to me to join this uh, meeting. Um, you know, statistics is a social good, and if statistics does not help achieve the aspirations of the people in a particular country, it means that statistics have failing to be what we want it to be. So with us, when we did an assessment on the capacity of the country to monitor the SDGs, then we firmly came with a conclusion that our traditional data sources alone are not enough. And so we needed to look elsewhere. And what do we need to do? So a couple of things came to mind, and including the, um, exploring the use of big data. But you realize that statisticians will usually not want to go for things that the methodology is not well established and um, 
uh, uh, the, the legal environment is not right for. And so one of the key things that we started looking at is uh, the legal regime we have in Ghana for the statistics office. So as we speak now, we have reviewed uh, the current law and the bill is currently with our parliament. Uh, we expecting that in the next couple of weeks, parliament is most likely to pass it into law to mandate the national statistical office to explore the use of big data to produce official statistics. So that was one of the key things that we thought was very important for us to do. Now, the second thing has to do with what kind of problem do we want to solve with these statistics? Example, when we look at the SDGs, we realize that in a developing country like Ghana, a lot of the indicators cannot be measured until five years because we rely heavily on sample surveys for, to produce data beyond, beside the censuses. And a lot of these sample surveys are conducted in five-year intervals. And if you want to wait for five years to know how things are changing and how, what you need to do to improve things, then you have already missed it. So in that respect, what can we do that provide us um, more uh, 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 timely data? So we look at this part of it. We can use telecom data. We can use some other sources of data. And so what we have been doing is exploring this area and we identify telecom data to be one of the key areas. So we started discussions with some of the telecom companies in Ghana and some other, because the capacity also to use it within the National Statistical Office is not there. And so we have been engaging with those who have the expertise. And as we speak on Thursday, in fact, we, for the data using the telecom data, we, uh, a project using the telecom data, it has taken us almost a year to start. And, but it's good for us because we wanted to make sure we deal with all the issues of security, all the legal issues, because Ghana had a data protection act. And the data protection commission has to come in and make sure that all the things that need to be done to ensure the security of the individuals are done. And as you speak, last week, we got an official clearance from the Data Protection Commission. And so this project is starting. And so on Thursday, we have a meeting with Flowminder and the telecom company and the National Statistical Office and other national stakeholders to move this project ahead. Another area has been, uh, uh, for instance, looking at uh, SDG 1161, which is looking at a proportion of urban wastes. Uh, that is uh, regularly collected with a final discharge um, uh, 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 point. Uh, we realize that uh, often we rely on uh, our sample surveys to provide data for it. And we have a challenge in terms of how much data we generate because often the indicators are produced at the national or the regional level. Yet programming and implementation is done at the district, which is the local level. Unfortunately, the National Statistical Office is usually unable to provide data at that level. So one of the key things is exploring the use of big data to provide data at that level that would be used by the local authority to plan their programming. I may want to um, keep it here uh, as we, the conversation goes on. Uh, may, maybe more specific examples will come. Uh, yes, and thank you, Omar, uh, to you as well for your initial thoughts uh, in order to see uh, where we are at this very moment, because that will be our second round of questions. Uh, you mentioned already um, specific uh, issues that are very important about capacity development, uh, and we are not only seeing those uh, in the Global South, we are actually seeing it around the globe uh, in national statistical offices that are still scoping out on how to deal with this and uh, yeah. it is actually quite interesting to see that when we reach out and actually map the examples of those that are integrating non-traditional data sources, actually we find examples like Ghana, uh, like Kenya, um, and others uh, like uh, in our own country here in Colombia. Uh, so the Global South is moving quite fast uh, in order to see and experiment. Uh, and that laboratory actually brings us uh, to the second question 
on where we are now. Um, Anna, you heard the, uh, what Omar said, uh, and you are confronted with capacities and data protection, of course. Uh, so where we are at this very moment, we would like to know a little bit more before we give the floor to our um, participants and attendees that are uh, listening to us and make some very specific questions to you as well. I would like to ask you, where are the main challenges now that you heard uh, Omar and how actually there is uh, not only a technical but also a political will uh, to open up this discussion? Uh, where do you find mainly the challenges uh, from the telecoms towards national statistical offices, but also with other actors like, for example, civil society, academia, because we have not heard much of those actors uh, being part of this equation. Are they actually talking to you? Are there counterparts that you are taking uh, not only serious but for real and engaging with them, or are we still very far away from that? Okay, can you hear I can hear you fine. I hope uh, colleagues and participants as well. Okay. Go ahead. Anna, actually it looks like we lost you, for example, because I have you now frozen. Uh, Rebecca, can you maybe help Anna and jump in with exactly the same question in case she cannot hear us? Uh, you will receive the same question anyway, but Anna, uh, are you back with us? Okay, no. So, Rebecca, please help us and we will try to connect Anna again. I see that she is moving, but I will ask my colleagues to uh, get her audio uh, back uh, to us. So, Rebecca, same question to you and I hope that Anna will join us in a second. Yeah, um, sorry, I was just unmuting myself. Um, so, I think it's a really uh, interesting point. Uh, for me, I do think um, kind of capacity of organizations to actually use this data is the most important thing, because if not, we're trying to create kind of lots of supply without demand. So, for example, in answer to some of the questions that you'd posed around, you know, where should we be most kind of investing? Um, I think like if that um, like real understanding of how to use these um, things kind of it becomes more embedded, then we actually don't need to worry about um, innovation grants, et cetera, to kind of um, get like citizen generated data or big data projects off the ground, because there are already a lot of really great and really scalable and um, very global solutions out there. Um, in terms of OpenStreetMap and how that relates um, more directly, um, I think there's kind of obviously some limitations, which Omar can definitely um, share in more detail. Um, but obviously, when you look from the outset at these kind of non-traditional data sources, and then you look at the process of official statistics, there's quite a big kind of daylight gap between, between those two things, because a lot of the citizen-generated data style things have been created around innovation. So there's platform specific, um, and they don't have like great time series, and they don't have like all these things which are really important in in official statistics. So I think one thing that really needs to happen is that um, we need to work together more. Um, I was on a really interesting panel uh, recently in the um, OECD World Forum where uh, the government of the Philippines was talking about uh, their own experiences um, trying to create a poverty index in their country and how other um, actors had come in and kind of tried to create a poverty index as well. Um, the government of the Philippines does it based on something like 130 indicators around consumption. Um, and the other actor that came in does it on one indicator of basically asking people if they think they live in poverty or not, um, which gives you quite a different outcome and um, is also really challenging. So I think like we really need to work to not undermine each other with these things. And we really need to work to uh, make sure that what uh, big data and citizen generated data is doing is actively supporting uh, NSOs because like at the end of the day, the government is responsible for delivering the SDGs and the NSO is, is responsible for all the data that is related to that. And so if we are not supporting that system, then we're, we're doing something 
possibly not even positive, but possibly negative, because we're really making it hard for them to enact their mission. So um, I really feel like there's some really great examples um, that we've had recently, for example, where we've been conducting a program and we've done like a census in that area um, to help the local municipality on something. Um, Censuses are really difficult to do in areas that change very frequently, like uh, refugee camps or slums, um, and in areas where you might have people who are kind of intentionally trying to avoid um, data being captured on themselves. Um, that's something that it's comparatively much easier for people to do that census um, via kind of citizen generated data and in something like OpenStreetMap, which is really kind of user friendly and, and easy for them to do. Um, so I think kind of those examples that we have coming out of like, oh, you know, here's here's where a census really helped this municipality to deliver this, or here's where a census really helped us understand how many refugees are living outside of camp setting in this area. Um, those examples are really promising. Um, also, CGD and big data can work together um, probably quite a lot better. Um, one thing that comes out all the time from um, uh, big data as mobile, especially is poverty index um, saying, you know, here is the poverty index for a country. But we literally know when we look at the poverty index of a country that there's people that don't have access to a phone. Um, and in many countries, we can identify where they are, because obviously, especially in kind of Peru, Colombia, where uh, where we're both based, then you have um, people renting a, someone else's phone to use just for a few minutes. So you have loads and loads of phones that are making absolute masses of really short calls all to different numbers so you can really ad easily identify where are the people who are not being captured by this and then citizen generated data projects in those areas to gather ex kind of additional supplementary data would be a really great way to say okay here's our poverty index which we now know is not excluding people because um we've kind of intentionally been able to design around that um, so yeah, I'm kind of, I guess, a very big advocate for trying to find the spaces where, um, you know, each of these three, three things, national statistics, citizen generated data and big data all have um, advantages and disadvantages. Um, but there's a, a lot of kind of ways in which we've seen them uh, being able to work together really, really nicely to um, essentially the things that are limitations in some aren't limitations in others. Um, so taking advantage of that. Cool. Uh, sounds so, sounds I think uh, quite challenging what you have just said, uh, Rebecca, because uh, we do have to still see the interface uh, in how we actually connect uh, to worlds that have not been speaking actually quite a lot, uh, be it the official statistical community um, and actually, well, uh, we could say uh, the rest of the data ecosystem uh, that works around the SDGs, and we have seen several examples you mentioned yourself uh, of partnerships that you are participating uh, and Omar uh, also working with colleagues uh, like Romander uh, and others on the ground in order to see how to actually translate to reality. Uh, in talking about reality, I see that we have uh, once again uh, a, a familiar face with us, which is Anna. Um, so Anna, uh, I am happy that you reconnected. Um, we didn't expect less from GSMA, uh, <laughs> not to get lost uh, in translation. Uh, so over to you, please uh, make uh, it short, concise, because we will go over then to Omar. I will then present actually the results of the survey that uh, we put out, and then we will open up uh, for 15 to 20 minutes uh, that we actually would like our colleagues who are listening to us now uh, to make their questions. So over to you, Anna. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. I didn't. I didn't know what happened. I was going to say so much for network connectivity, right? So <laughs> I always get the same um, when technical things happen um, in our in our meetings. But what what I was going and I'm sorry with all this trouble. I didn't listen to Rebecca's last intervention, but I was about to react to something Omar said that is super important, and is the capacity of the agencies to use the data. And that's one thing that is of key importance to the companies because for them, they are running a lot of risks by using data. The data they have of their users is one of the main points of interactions companies have with users. And one wrong step in terms of using that customer data can be catastrophic 
for the company in terms of reputation, legal consequences, etc. So they are running a risk. And giving this information, sharing the information with um, an agency, be it government or non-government, it can be a multilateral organization receiving the information that is not ready and capable of using the data in an impactful manner doesn't make the risk worth for the company. So that's a sure way of losing the interest from the companies. And you were asking me about other challenges and risks that we have. Um, the, and where we are, you were, your question was where we are now in terms of protecting the data, knowing that we are using the data correctly. According to our own studies, there are over 100 laws around the world protecting data. In different countries, it, it's called different with some nuances here and there, but there are over 100. In addition to the regulation that already exists, the industry, the mobile industry has taken steps to establish principles and best practices, because sometimes we feel that the law is not even addressing some serious concerns that companies are aware of when managing the data. So we have, in addition to the legal requirements, we have our own principles. I invite everyone to check those um, principles online it's around security, how to use it, when to use it, what to collect, etc. We do um, we do advocate for regulation. This is my closing remark. We advocate for regulation. We believe it, it's necessary, but it has to be smart and enabling regulation because non-enabling regulation it's another big obstacle and there are um, legislations where we just can't go with our program because the regulation doesn't allow us so while regulation is needed we also need a smart and enabling enabling regulation Super. Thank you, Anna. Uh, and now let's flip uh, for the last uh, answer. Omar, you have always heard probably uh, people telling you whatever uh, statistical offices are lacking uh, and what they need to do in order to engage. I would like to flip actually the question and ask you, what have you been confronted, be it from uh, foundations, think tanks, academia, uh, and even companies, uh, where are the main challenges to actually engage them? Uh, so I would like to turn the question around, not only pointing at statistical offices and where you lack, where do you find it the other way around that we still need to scale up the process uh, and engagement of others? Uh, your views on that, Omar. Yeah, thank you. Um... One of the first and uh, foremost challenges um, in this area has been that of allocating the scarce resources to try something that statisticians are not used to. And it's, it's a bit challenging to get the National Statistical Office to commit the little resource they have to do sample surveys or censuses into this new area. So one of the key things for us was to uh, talk to uh, different partners to see who could support this idea uh, to demonstrate to the, the statistical office that if we invest in this, in the long run, we're going to have this much returns. So in our case, for instance, with all the things that we have put in place, it is interesting to know that the board of directors of the NSO at this point have agree that our next um, uh, uh, funding, the, the next development framework that we have for the NSO, they're committing so much resources for capacity building within the NSO in this area of big data and telecom data. So uh, uh, it is one of the key things. With academia, it has been an issue of trust. Already, um, national statistical offices, not everybody understand how you come out with aggregate showing that, okay, this proportion of the population are faced with this kind of issue. Um, when people see some other places that this thing is not there, you always have to let people know that these are estimates coming out of a sample. Okay, in that respect, you realize that now the, some people already have some challenges with uh, uh, maybe population figures that are coming out. Now you want to divert into these other areas. And then they're seeing it to be a more bigger problem that you are calling for yourself. 
But what we have been able to do is to make sure we set up a team that include academia, civil society, think tanks, and media persons. So that at the end of the day, we build together and we all understand what we are doing. And so that has been one of the mitigation uh, that we have employed. Perfect. Thank you, Omar, um, as well, once again, for those comments. And I would like to actually give you now some insights of what people are thinking uh, about what has been taught. Uh, Anna uh, just uh, mentioned the enabling environment, um, and that's something we saw also important uh, to ask. And as you will see at this very moment, I'm putting uh, up the presentation. I, I hope everyone is seeing it as well. Um, is it on? Uh, I will ask my colleagues here to help me as well because technology is something. Uh, we will see. Um, we asked actually our our participants uh, what is an ideal enabling environment uh, to use big data and citizen generated data. Uh, and we thought uh, it was interesting to share those results with you uh, because. 31% said it was trust building and public partnerships, uh, something that actually just Omar ended up saying uh, at this very moment. And uh, the results are coming up, uh, I hope, on your screen uh, very so, uh, soon as well. The second one, very close by, was capacity building on technical skills and interpretability. Um, you excuse here my English. Um, and as you will see, uh, the third one was inclusive legal frameworks and high data quality. Uh, so those four, especially when we're seeing that the first one, it's trust building and public partnerships, that gives us a clear sense that we still have to get closer um, and make sure that we have the possibilities to build those bridges and actually be able uh, in order to do so. Um, the second question that we said is, uh, with the limited resources available, which fields uh, should receive more funding to scale up the use of non-traditional data sources? The first uh, answer um, was, and the first answer was with institutional capacity building and technological tools, uh, both with 33%. So we see here capacity still remains very high, but how do we translate also the technology available for those that are uh, using it. And the last one is which of the following data sources is more reliable for you? And a 60% uh, Omar said official statistics combined with other sources. And uh, a 25% mentioned NSOs and government uh, bodies um, are the most reliable. So we're seeing we're going back uh, to the basics and trusting those that are producing the data that we have been used and we're seeing here very clearly uh, the necessity on how uh, we actually be able uh, to have a relationship that is much more convenient and effective uh, at this very moment, Peter. Uh, and therefore, it comes now to, to a QA. and uh, We have some of the questions we have received here uh, already raised in our discussions and I would like to uh, now ask uh, uh, participants to raise uh, their their hands um, if there are other questions you would like to raise because I have here a series uh, written down that I will also to put uh, to our panelists but if any attendee has a very particular question to our uh, panelists please raise your hands and we will unmute you in order uh, to bring you into the floor um, so I will actually before we do that and my colleagues uh, start giving you the floor I have some questions here for Anna. Is the 9-11 services taken into the consideration? I mean, for this kind of operational kind of data recollection. That's a question we got uh, from the, the attendees. Uh, Anna, 9-11, uh, not a good number, uh, but uh, tell us how do you think, is it integrated or not? Uh, that's a specific question you got. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. Is and and the short answer is no, for the most cases, it's not um, it's not integrated in in the most cases because 
the exercises have been more a partnership between very specific agencies. So it's either um, UNICEF, for example, in one case with the operator, and it doesn't involve in many cases the one the 911 services involves the government. Now there are a few exceptions to that, and that's a good a good point that I will take back and and make more of an active effort from our end to involve the 911 services. There are a few exceptions, and the one that I like the most is in Argentina, where we have and it's around gender violence. They have a line dedicated to uh, emergencies around gender violence. And we have been working with that with that 9-11 service, and we even committed as an industry to guarantee the anonymity of the calls, which was not happening. This was this is very recent. Until a year ago, if a woman called from her cell phone to report domestic violence, in her cell phone, it would be reported that she called. So it was traceable back to her as being the person making the call. Now, after we working with that 911 service, there's anonymity um, in her phone won't appear the record of the call. In her or his, there is um, there are male cases also contacting gender violence. So answer is not as a rule. In some exceptions, it has happened, but it is a very good point to take back to my program to make an active effort. Thanks, Anna. Uh, we have a question from Claudia Lopez. Uh, Claudia, uh, please raise your question, but first introduce yourself. Claudia, I believe you're already on mute and the floor is yours to make your question. No. Then I will go over uh, if Claudia still has some problems uh, in connecting. Um, I have a question here for Omar. What is non-traditional data uh, that can give for leadership? For Wow, that I have to translate first. Sorry here. Uh, can someone discuss actual SDG indicators that are being measured? I think that's an easier one. Uh, please do help me with the English uh, when you raise your questions. Um, can someone discuss actual SDG indicators? Rebecca, uh, do you have, you mentioned uh, some pilots and you mentioned also difficulties of it, uh, but tell us if you have uh, specific indicators that you are focusing on that we can give uh, the attendees some uh, insights about them. And Omar, the same question to you as well. Um, yeah, so at high level, um, we're really interested in um, Kind of, I think it's about more or less 25% of the SDG indicators are directly spatial. Um, so they're things like proportion of population with access to something. Um, and some of those are a bit more um, obvious, like access to a road, access to a hospital. And some of them are, are slightly uh, less kind of predictable, like um, access to a library. Um, and um, so across all of those spatial, like those indicators, um, you cannot measure them unless you know sort of where um, the people are and where those services are. Um, and there's often some really informal ways in which people could be, for example, receiving that service, but without that necessarily being that obvious. Um, so things like mobile clinics, mobile libraries, things like um, informal electricity lines, things like uh, not having Wi-Fi, but having access to a phone hotspot. Like that does mean you still have internet, but it, it is very difficult to uh, to kind of aggregate all those things together. So uh, we're really interested in the spatial ones, um, particularly where I think they, they play into the SDGs very strongly is around um, infectious diseases, um, water and sanitation, and the sustainable cities um, indicators. So, you can kind of make arguments um, across all of them. I think those three are probably um, the strongest. Um, and yeah, as I said, in terms of um, kind of actual projects which feed into those, again, they're, for us, they're, they're often um, very much in response to a problem. So, you know, um, 
one recent example in Liberia is like the the government of Liberia wants to make um, better decisions around um, planning um, and making sure that they are able to provide um, services in cities. Um, so they include things like waste removal, um, drainage, um, being able to get like a 16 year old who lives in a kind of informal neighborhood to use like a $30 smartphone that they already own to walk around their streets and create a map which enables them to answer all those questions is quite kind of cool in terms of uh, really that data is like being created by someone from the community with lo like our tagline is like local tools, uh, local people uh, just add knowledge. So it's an entirely sustainable local solution um, that is actually helping that government with way better data than they used to be able to afford when they only had kind of like 10 experts working on this. Now they can have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of, uh, of volunteers and citizens um, creating better data than they ever had before from people with like multiple degrees and really expensive uh, imported equipment. So I think it's a really kind of nice story in terms of putting like the power around data back in the hands of people that that live there. Um, but yeah, there's a, it's, it's really quite a far reaching um, area because obviously uh, mapping and geodata is, is kind of cross sects uh, most of the SDGs. Thanks, Rebecca. Mm -hmm. uh, before giving the, the floor now to, to Omar in order to wrap up, uh, my colleagues from Paris 21 and Open Data Watch are also on the line. If they would like uh, to have a closing question, uh, I will open the mic for them as well. So please uh, give me a heads up. Uh, but Omar, uh, the question still remains to you. And uh, now over to you in Accra. Yeah, um, one of the uh, SDG, specific SDG indicators we are seeking to measure um, is 1.4.1, um, uh, 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 which is looking at proportion of population living in households with access to uh, basic services. That is one of the indicators we're seeking to measure. Another one I mentioned earlier is 11.6.1, which is a proportion of urban solid waste that is regularly collected with a funnel disposal uh, 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 place. And then thirdly, 11.7.2, um, which is looking at proportion of males and females who are subjected to physical or sexual violence. And that one, we're going to pilot it in one of our local areas to see how uh, we can use, because we are unable to have data from our uh, uh, routine data collection processes. So we are piloting that one with one of these uh, 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 citizens generated data. Philip, and if yeah. I may take one second, because the mobile <laughs> industry has made a very big effort to measure SDG indicators, and I want to invite everyone to check out our SDG impact report. We have done it for three years, super comprehensive study and measurement at the indicator level. Nice. Uh, Anna, um, you just mentioned uh, the report and as well you mentioned the guidelines and principles uh, and we got some examples from Rebecca and from Omar. Uh, we will make sure that all attendees uh, that joined us today will receive uh, that information via email. Um, we will distribute uh, as well the recordings as my colleague Alexandra mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and before saying goodbye, I simply want to know uh, if my colleagues from Paris 21 or Open Data Watch uh, are with us and raising their hands uh, at this moment, or if we can let everybody now uh, go. It is um, before I do so. Are we having them? Uh, okay. No, it looks like uh, they, are, they are happy with the results of today. Uh, and we will be having uh, you very posted about the fourth webinar that Paris 21, Open Data Watch, and CEPE will be organizing. Uh, I'm very proud that for a Latin American organization and moderation, uh, we actually are wrapping up at zero, zero hours. Um, <laughs> and we made two uh, to Ana Maria, Omar, and Rebecca, first of all. Thank 
thank you. We are grateful, but we are also very grateful uh, for the attendees from around the globe to have joined us. We will keep you posted and thank you very much for your time. It has been for us not only a pleasure, but an honor uh, to have you here in this discussion. So a good day from Borota, Colombia. I will leave you with a good Colombian coffee right uh, now. <laughs> part of the world. So goodbye to you and bye-bye. Yeah. Ciao, ciao. Thank you very much. Ciao, Thank ciao. you. Bye-bye.